me they don't know very much about Serbian history. Many fled the bombing, which had pummeled all of Yugoslavia, but was most heavily concentrated on Kosovo. Others fled to avoid the fighting between 40,000 Yugoslav troops and 35,000 fighters aligned with the KLA. After the bombing began, Albanian communities, which were strongholds of the KLA, were targeted by Serbian paramilitaries. I stayed with an Albanian family who had been, at one point they'd left, they'd, they'd, they'd fled their homes. They were in, a, in an entirely Albanian district. They said that it was about four or five days after the bombing started that some Serbian APCs had come up and had, had machine gun strafed the upper stories of the buildings. And no one had been hurt because everyone was in the basements and, and from the bombing. Um, and I asked him why, you know, didn't they come door to door? I thought that was the story. And he says, are you kidding? They were petrified, so the Serbs were petrified of the KLA. Placed on the defensive by images of refugees fleeing, administration spokesmen claimed that they had intelligence from German sources that the Serbian government had planned to expel refugees even if NATO had not bombed, and that ethnic cleansing had been going on all along. We were all told that Operation Horseshoe was in the wind and that this had all been planned long before NATO bombing. After the war, however, German Brigadier General Heinz Lokai revealed that Operation Horseshoe was a sham. No such operation ever existed, he told the Sunday Times of London. OSCE monitors also discounted claims that ethnic cleansing had been going on before the bombing. This notion of, of the justification of a war for humanitarian reasons is just blatantly false. The uh, United Nations uh, Commission for Human Rights uh, recorded their first external refugee on, on March the 28th, three days after the air war started. To protect their own pilots from casualties, NATO bombing took place at high speeds and high altitudes. This politically motivated strategy posed little threat to the Yugoslav military, but NATO bombs dropped from high altitudes would kill hundreds of civilians, including Albanian refugees in Jakovica and Korisha. At first, the U.S. Department of Defense tried to blame the Serbs, but reporters on the scene found cluster bomb fragments with British markings. The claim that NATO was targeting only military facilities was one of many falsehoods that were used to build public support for the bombing campaign. They ran out of military targets within the first couple of weeks. And, uh, I mean, this is now common knowledge that NATO indeed expanded their targets uh, to stage three, which was civilian targets. They ran out of targets, otherwise they wouldn't have been hitting little bridges across rivers in Serbia on a Sunday afternoon or hitting marketplaces in Niš. The plan was to first put pressure on the population and second to, to destroy the uh, Yugoslav economy so deeply, so uh, intensively that uh, Yugoslavia would have to bear for, for a long time period of time to recover and that it could recover only uh, on the help from outside. NATO bombs and missiles struck the foundations of the country's economy, destroying petroleum refineries and chemical and heating plants. These attacks left a trail of environmental devastation. The use of cluster bombs dropped from high altitudes in civilian areas had devastating consequences in population centers such as Niš in southern Serbia and Pristina, the capital of Kosovo. I mean, I know there was a proliferation of cluster bombs used against Pristina, and there was all kinds of these empty casings that showed still, still clearly the American markings. Scores of schools, hospitals, and apartment buildings were hit in what NATO described as accidents of war, but which were the predictable result of NATO's strategy of high-altitude bombing. Military experts say the methodic destruction by NATO bombs of a full passenger train clearly crossed the line between legal and illegal warfare. The pilot had hit the wiring which had immobilized the train, so it was a sitting duck, made a second pass, and it deliberately attacked the jammed passenger cars and, and basically murdered unarmed people. They weren't just targeting his military targets. When they're starting to take out police buildings in Belgrade, foreign affairs ministry in Belgrade, the TV stations. Sixteen people were killed when the radio and TV Serbia television station was struck by NATO cruise missiles. They killed several technicians and cameramen and a makeup artist. Her hands were found over a hundred yards away in a park. 
two people there, and this was late at night, uh, were vaporized. None of their remains have ever been found. A variety of reasons were given for destroying the civilian target, but NATO officials were clearly concerned when radio and television Serbia permitted international news media, such as CNN and CBS, to broadcast images of other civilian casualties to the U.S. and NATO countries. When they began to make journalists a legitimate target, it became, you know, truly an information war. It was after that bomb that Yugoslavia allowed more reporters in and started to get more of the story out from its point of view. But it's also after that bombing that uh, the International Criminal Tribunal issued its uh, war crimes indictments against Mr. Milosevic and other key officials in the government. Although the ad hoc war crimes tribunal is prohibited from taking instructions from individual governments, following a meeting with President Clinton, the tribunal's prosecutor, Louise Arbor, announced an indictment against President Milosevic and his military leaders. The timing of the indictment was controversial because the war still raged and there was little opportunity to gather reliable evidence. The whole act was a very political one because no, nobody really uh, could expect that uh, um, Milosevic uh, could be brought uh, before, before court. So it was nothing else than uh, propaganda again and to enhance the pressure on Yugoslavia and to influence public opinion. It will help to deter future war crimes by establishing that those who give orders will be held accountable. Would NATO leaders also be held accountable for violations of international law? Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, and the UN High Commissioner on Human Rights charged that NATO bombing had violated international law. According to Human Rights Watch, at least half the 500 civilian deaths attributed to NATO bombing could be considered war crimes. The attack by a coalition of parties led by the United States, to me, is outright aggression. The Yugoslavs, the Serbs in particular, did not attack any NATO country whatever and didn't threaten any of them. Uh, they decided they were going to change policies in Yugoslavia and did it by military means. That is the first war crime. Second, in the bombing, although they were fairly cautious for the first couple of days in the targets they selected, ultimately they selected widespread non-military targets. But the ad hoc Yugoslavia tribunal, largely funded and staffed by NATO countries, failed to conduct a formal investigation of NATO actions. Carla Del Ponte, the current prosecutor at the International Criminal Tribunal, has been forced to review some evidence and has come out with a finding that dismisses any further investigations for now. But the pressure has not been concerted because, again, this was a conspiracy of 19 NATO governments to bomb. And those governments are very like-minded. They know they have violated international law, but as long as they all stick together, they can maintain the appearance that they were, they were doing this for truth and justice. Bombs aside, the NATO war on Yugoslavia was also a war of words and numbers. I think there's no doubt that our political leaders lied to us. President Clinton, Prime Minister Tony Blair, were all talking about genocide taking place in Kosovo. Even by NATO's own figures, prior to the bombing, they estimated that there were a total of 2,000 casualties in Kosovo, Serbs and Albanians, which isn't, unfortunately, when we're talking figures of people being killed, they're all bad, but 2,000 is a pretty low intense intensity figure. The, the exaggeration of the figures continued during the war as a justification for the bombing. We had a soccer stadium story right at the end of March, about the 30th or 31st, it was alleged that 100,000 Albanian men were already missing, that they'd been jammed by the thousands into the soccer stadium at Pristina. And a variation of the story reported over 5,000 in another soccer stadium in Petch. An Agence France press reporter who managed to stay in Yugoslavia actually went the following day to the Pristina soccer stadium, found the infield grass in perfect condition, found the lone caretaker uh, there who confirmed, of course, the place had been empty since before the bombing began. NATO spokespersons announced that Albanian moderate Ibrahim Rugova and four other top Albanian officials had been executed by the Serbs. Reliable sources report that 
and you'll have to excuse my pronunciation. Firmi Aghani, a member of the Kosovo Albanian delegation at Rambui, principal Raguva advisor and peace negotiator over much of the past year, was executed on Sunday. All were still alive, however. Rugova was soon shown on Serbian television in discussions with Serbian President Milosevic.